You know how some days you just wake up kinda pissed off at the world? You're clueless, you're alone. You don't know why everything is the way it is, why you have to work, study, eat, it's all just very annoying. You look up at the sky and wish to just soar through it and forget all your worries. Or you just hate every human being around you with their dumb little talks and clearly know less about the thing they're discussing than you and you just have to sit there and endure it and you just can't believe how inferior they are to you. Or maybe that's just me. Well, regardless, that's exactly what Berman is about. Created by Yellow Tanabe, Berman follows Aishi Karasuma, a middle school student who really shouldn't be having the thoughts I described in the opening. He thinks himself superior than others who waste their time having fun, or just talking to their friends, sharing viral clips with each other, or just hanging out. Our second protagonist, though, is a completely different person. Mikisada Komoda is a demon. Although he's in the same middle school and grade as Aishi, he easily beats up a group of high schoolers. And when these two forces clash, we actually learn that they're best friends and that Komoda isn't as he looks. He may have the strength of a professional wrestler at the age of 14, but he has a nice heart and is really trying his best to do good at school. And he also loves cats. And finally, the third and fourth major characters we meet are Rei Sagisawa and Suame Umino. Sakisawa being from an extremely high class family who's super popular at school. He's that one character that gives off this happy vibe but you know they're going to have a super messed up backstory later and Tsubame is this massively cheerful and optimistic person who is great at martial arts and always tries to brighten the mood of everyone around her. All of these people run into each other for wanting to spot a mysterious birdman who's been flying around all over town but while getting back to school after skipping class however, they get in a car accident and are saved by the very same Birdman. I was racking my brain trying to think of what really sets Birdman apart from all the other quote-unquote superhero stories and I reached two things. Number one is that Birdman is surprisingly realistic and I'm not talking about the actual main characters of our story turning into Birdman or the technology behind it all, but more so the way it treats being a superhuman in the eyes of children. Aishi and his group barely understand how their powers work and spend a good amount of time just practicing flying. Oh, I forgot to mention, but when they were saved by the Berman, they actually turn into one. So yeah, that's how it works. But once they fly, do they go after the main bad guy who was teased in a previous chapter? No, they seek the help of an adult because 14 year old kids are fucking dumb and don't know what to do. I just love this plot point so much, it shows how having your whole world turned upside down is extremely daunting and many would start to question what to do with their powers or even if they want it to begin with. Actually now that I think about it, what's up with all these superheroes just suddenly becoming heroes out of the blue? Like, I legitimately want to see someone acquire a superpower and do nothing and just continue with their life, but I digress. Now before we move on to the second reason of why I love Berman so much, I need to get a few negative things out of the way, but bear with me, Berman is super awesome, but I just have to mention a few things. So every four chapters or so, we usually get a huge fight scene in Berman. Although they're not that long and are finished rather quickly, I still feel like they're a major part of Berman as a whole. However, the only thing that hinders your enjoyment a bit is that the fights are all over the place. You see, the main threat to our characters in the story are anomalies called blackouts. It's when a giant circle shaped void suddenly appears out of the blue and a mysterious monster emerges from that. The monster is ranging from an extremely huge statue of Buddha holding a basketball to a mask wearing monkey who all relate closely to one of our main characters' insecurities. For example, in chapter 12, our heroes encounter blackout in the middle of the day. After taking all of their clothes off and transforming, I needed to put that detail in, they fly up into the air and bring out the monster out of the void, this time it being a creepy puppet-like being. After a few pages of ass kicking and whatever Aishi was trying to accomplish here, the monster seems to go for a bite of Ray's head but instead utters, truth is, I never loved you. It's chilling and we later realize that was the voice of Ray's dead older brother. Now, this is all done fine with Yellow's great artwork, but did you see the problem? The Void in Birdman can create whatever it wants. It can be a puppet like we talked about, a huge coffin, an eyeball with a mouth, you name it. Moreover, the Birdman themselves don't really have a specific fighting style. Sure, Komoda is great at generally beating people up and Aishi goes about things by devising a genius plan, but we don't really know their powers. 
What most of the fights boil down to is a bunch of flying people and a random monster going toe to toe with each other without us really having the ability to predict the outcome or really know what's going on. Compare that to Jojo for example. In there too, the powers that the characters hold, called stands, are kinda similar to blackouts in terms that they can literally be anything, but each has its own unique design and set of powers. One can stop time, attack using fire powers, manipulate the weather, or even boil water. Stans themselves also share a loose set of rules like how stands can only be seen by stand users or how usually the further away a stand is from its user, the weaker it gets. This creates a lot of excitement and tension in the fights. The heroes are not only trying to find out the power of their enemies but simultaneously trying to overcome them using clever means. Berman doesn't have that. You don't really know the powers of your own main heroes, let alone the enemies they face, which leads you to just treat the fights as regular old exposition. Actually, I lied. Each character does have unique abilities, like Ishii for example is a bellwether, meaning he's great at leadership and can easily control people, or Sakaar is great at creating illusions, but these abilities are rarely used in clever ways in the actual fights. It's a real shame too, because there is some great foundation here, it just hasn't been explored more. Uh, one other thing is that Berman kinda just ends, and to explain what I mean by that, I have to talk about the ending a bit. It isn't really massive, but here's a timestamp for the spoiler just in case. And I'm going to spoil the ending of Attack on Titan just for good measure. I'm, I'm serious, I'm crazy, I'll do it, Look, so you've been warned. So the seven of the beginning are introduced halfway throughout the story, which are these ultra powerful burnmen who once united can do literally anything and reshake the world. Each of the seven people has a unique worldview depending on their family and friends and wants to do things their own way, not to mention other factions who are also trying to pursue their own goals in this broken world. But instead of creating some really interesting conflicts between all of these moving parts, the story just does the most predictable, cliche, 6 out of 10, overall living peacefully together now thing that it was really underwhelmed. Which reminds me of another manga slash anime I experienced recently called Shingeki no Kyojin or Attack on Titan which kinda does the same thing but a lot worse. I, I've, I've finished Attack on Titan and I have to rant about it, okay? I just have to. And I just realized I've been cursed with bad endings until the end of time. So if you've been living under a rock for the past, what, 10 years, I'm gonna summarize the very basic plot of Attack on Titan. So there's this island paradise with people living in them peacefully, protected by these walls, but then titans attack, they have to defend themselves, yada yada yada, oops, turns out people can turn into titans, now, ooh, we're in another country, ooh, crazy stuff. The main conflict in Attack on Titan stems from the fact that there are two completely different human beings living in this world. The first group, which are called Eldians, have the ability to turn into titans. There are only nine who can actually harness the power and control it, but others, if injected with a special serum, will turn into brainless and hungry titans. And the second group are basically everyone else who are just normal and can turn into a titan. This is really interesting because how do you solve this conflict? Should the Eldians be eradicated just because they can turn into titans, despite them being normal people who have dreams, goals, and aspirations, or having people who they love? Or should the world suffer because of that? It paints a really brutal and painful picture full of death and sacrifices which ultimately had meaning. Every single person a part of this world sacrificed a piece of themselves just to change something. But the ending just throws it all away and now we're all living peacefully together, oh well. Now, Burnman doesn't do it that badly, mostly because the stakes weren't that high and the story rarely brought the whole worldly conflict into it, but still, it's a pretty similar situation. There are two groups of people, some have extreme superpowers but are ultimately human, some don't, and some organizations are just out there trying to reach their goals. These types of stories with extremely complicated moral dilemmas are super hard to tell and I guarantee when someone nails it, it becomes super popular super fast but Attack on Titan and more importantly Birdman abandon what they were trying to accomplish. Again, it's not that bad in Birdman, to be honest I kinda like how it handled a lot of things, I just wish it was done better. Also, one other small thing that doesn't really have any effect on the grand scheme of things, but I appreciated regardless, was Birdman's representation of gay and trans characters. When it comes to LGBT plus representation in anime slash manga, it seems like most of the characters who fall under this demographic are often played up to be loud, flamboyant, and over the top. And although that's mostly fine and we've had tons of great LGBT characters before, it may still rub some people the wrong way, but I feel like we need to understand that these generally come from a kind place, a place where some don't really know how to portray these sorts of stuff. Especially considering gay marriage is still illegal in Japan and a lot of places are unfortunately not welcome to them. 
in Birdman, one of the seven rings and is trans, Alva is gay, and the story doesn't really dwell on that, they're just there and kick ass. I don't know, something about it just made me so happy and I thought I should share it. And finally, the second and most important reason I love Birdman so much and why I'm making this video in the first place is that Birdman isn't really about saving people. Birdman is a journey through maturity. It's the only manga I've read set in school that actually makes sense why it's set in school. Every single character who's introduced here is going through very rough periods of their lives. Aishi's father has basically abandoned him and his mother and there's this panel where Aishi says if he ever stops messaging him, his father might forget about him. Takayama lost both of his parents to a plane crash and one of the main reasons he's so obsessed with being a better birdman and lengths he's willing to go for saving people is to do the thing he couldn't for his parents. Tsubame's father is diagnosed with a terminal illness and despite it, she does her best to motivate others with her energetic and positive nature. Every birdman, no, every person in this manga shares a similar story. Berman tells you that you're not alone, that the hardships you're dealing with right now, tons of others are experiencing. Berman teaches you how the first impressions you get from people are just that, first impressions. It's only after talking to them and being friends with them for a while that we understand that people are more complicated than we had initially thought. Life sometimes goes too fast and doesn't really give you the ability to think, you're more often than not forced to follow whatever everyone else is doing, getting farther and farther away from the things you love. But despite all of this, you come out of it a better person, with more people to love, more places to explore, and more memories to cherish. At the end of the day, having wings is not what makes you special.